Council number 13, the people of the state of New York versus William Flanagan. Council. Good morning, Your Honor. I'd like to reserve um, three minutes rebuttal time, if three I Three minutes? Yes, please. You may. May it please the court, my name is Donna Aldea, and I represent appellant William Flanagan. Your Honors, there cannot be a crime when an act that is committed is authorized. There cannot be a crime for official misconduct when an act that is not performed is discretionary. This court has recognized it, and every commentator that has addressed the statutes that are at so issue in this case. So do the police have unlimited discretion to determine to not go forward with a uh, felony investigation? Yes. The criminal, well, yes and no. The criminal procedure law, specifically section 140.10, provides that there are instances where arrest is not mandatory and provides that there are instances where arrest is mandatory. So pursuant to those sections, an officer has a mandatory obligation to arrest in many of the cases actually cited by my opposing counsel in her brief where there are domestic violence incidents or other things. What about that where required. there's sufficient evidence uh, and there is a willing Complain it. Then the statute provides that an officer may arrest. It is a good thing for police officers. And what officers. is that statute? That statute is Criminal Procedure Law, Section 14010. There, it is a good thing for police officers to have discretion. The discretion can be exercised in individual cases to help people that are poor as well as people that are rich, and in fact, it often is. It is a good thing for that matter, not just for police officers to have discretion, but for prosecutors to have discretion, to drop charges when they don't think the charges should be pursued, sometimes in the interest of justice. But that's really not at all what's happening here, right? I mean, what's happening here, and we all know the record, is this is back and forth, your, your client is involved with the school, and ultimately the property which isn't properly vouchered is returned to the school. There are the other issues surrounding that and ultimately he receives gift cards and a watch. So it's not I go out there and I see a crime being committed or I don't know if I have enough evidence, it's a discretionary call. This is very different and I think to analogize it to a discretion in making a rat is misleading in a way. It's not the analogy here. Well, Your Honor, the question before this court, first and foremost, is whether each of the statutory elements was proven. So the statute has, it's true, an element of a mens rea element, which is what Your Honor is getting to. In other words, the, the motive for performing the actions or not performing actions. With but the it, expectation that you're going to receive something, and isn't that critical? Well, that's the mens rea element. But in addition to but that- But haven't we said you can't separate those out with such a bright line? No, Your Honor. Actually, this court has said the opposite. And the Supreme Court has said the opposite as recently as six months ago in uh, its McDonald decision. It has repeatedly been held that the mens rea and the actus reus are separate, and they must be evaluated separately. The mens rea element in this case deals with the intent to obtain a benefit, or in this case, the intent to confer a benefit upon a friend. But the question here is, did the people satisfy the actus reus? For the portion of the statute under subdivision one that charges the malfeasance, that statute specifically requires that an unauthorized act be committed. In this case, the only unauthorized act, defined as the pe by the penal law as a bodily movement, is in this case, according to the indictment, the return of the property. But the return- but counsel, could you have an authorized act that was done for an improper or unauthorized purpose? And that's exactly where we differ. If you have an unauthorized act that is committed, and additionally it is committed for an illicit purpose, you have a crime. If you have an authorized act, which is what we have here, the return of property when the defendant wants it back, when the complainant wants it back, then you don't have one of the elements of the statute satisfied. And it is a fundamental tenet of statutory construction that you cannot simply ignore one of the elements of a crime. What the prosecution is asking this court to do is to conflate the mens rea element with the actus reus. And it is fundamental criminal law that that cannot be done. Our whole system of justice is premised on the principle that we do not punish someone for their thoughts. But that's what the prosecutor seeks to do. The prosecutor seeks to say the statute requires an unauthorized act, practice commentaries, 
treatises, cases have all held the act has to be unauthorized in addition, separately, in addition to being performed with the intent for a benefit. And the prosecutor is asking this court to fundamentally change all of criminal law, to simply excise the actus reus but and the statutory isn't the point element. That, that you're not authorized to act corruptly. You're not authorized to do something for a reason that's not lawful under the law. And it is corrupt to do this because you're trying to help the father of the suspect. Again, that's a conflation of the mens rea element into the element. Well, that's an expression of what is and isn't authorized. But, Your Honor, what I would say is, more fundamentally, we're bound by the indictment and the crimes that were charged in this case. The indictment in this case charged that the unauthorized act was the return of property to the school. And I would note that that act was absolutely 100% authorized. In fact, the people in their brief now have reverted to a theory that was never addressed in the trial, never charged in the accusatory instrument, never before the trial court, which was that this was a violation of Penal Law 45010 because there was a failure to comply with the technical requirements. And I believe Your Honor asked whether the property was valid or whether the property was photographed. First thing I would say is Penal Law 45010 was complied with. Penal Law 45010 is designed to protect criminal defendants, not prosecutors. Criminal Procedure Law 450, I'm sorry, Penal Law 45010 is designed to ensure that a defendant can view property and examine it before it's released to the complainant. Where the complainant asks for the property back and the defendant is asking for it back after he's examined it, the provision is inapplicable. Additionally, that provision, if you look at it, requires only that notice be given to the defendant of when the property will be returned. Here that notice was provided. That's what all the emails between Flanagan and Parker show. They provide notice of this is when the property is going to be returned. So let's get back to this whole issue, which I can't get beyond right now. You have a willing complainant who wants to go forward and press a charge. Correct. The police have sufficient evidence to conduct their investigation and even make an arrest here. What is it that I'm not going to ask what motivates, but what is it that allows the deputy commissioner to be involved to say to halt any forward movement on that investigation? I'm not following what your reasoning is. Well, the first thing, so this goes under the second element, the second defense, which is the nonfeasance, the failure to arrest. So first of all, the deputy commissioner himself, as the people conceded at trial, never had an obligation to make an arrest. Secondly, the deputy commissioner, in this case, specifically Flanagan, was- He runs the department, though. Actually, no. The people no. who were I involved in the arrest, at the time he first became involved in this case, he was in charge of the Asset Forfeiture Bureau, and actually contained within the um, record he had in this supervisory case, authority in that department. Yes, and contained within the record in this case is a chain of command. And that chain of command very, show, very clearly shows that both in that role and after he was promoted to second deputy commissioner in charge of special product projects, the squad, which makes the arrest, was never within his chain of command. So he never had the authority to order that squad to do anything. But more importantly, in this case, there's never been any proof by the people that Flanagan ordered a non-arrest. There has never been any email for all of the hundreds of emails, thousands of pages of testimony that this court has before it. There's no evidence not from one. which you can have a reasonable inference? No, Your Honor, there is none. Because he was involved in this case for a very, very brief period of time. His involvement in this case, and again, we're limited to the indictment. The indictment charges that he was involved in this case only from June of 2009 until September 1st of 2009 when the property was returned. Now during that period of time, what was going on is Principal Poppy had clearly expressed that she wanted the police department to hold off. Principal Poppy had clearly expressed that she wanted the property back to the school. The property, initially, two co-conspirators, charged co-conspirators, wound up trying to coerce her to sign a withdrawal of prosecution form as a precondition to getting back the property, which was illegal and was impermissible under the criminal procedure law and the penal law, because there's no such precondition required. You can return the property to a complainant without them dropping the charges. And so during the time that Flanagan got involved, far from joining that conspiracy, what he did is he got a call or he, he was approached 
by Gary Parker and said, hey, the school wants the property back. I want to give them the property back. They may decide not to prosecute my son if they get the property back. Why can't we give it back to them? I don't understand. Does the district attorney have a role in this process? None at all, because at this point, there was not yet a prosecution. At this point, there was not yet an arrest, and so the district attorney's office wasn't involved. There was no accusatory instrument that had yet been filed, which would have then involved the courts. So, Kelso, I, I just want to go back to the malfeasance again about an authorized act, not an unauthorized act, but an authorized act, and then you have a problem later because the police, for example, are doing something that is unauthorized. For example, police officers escort a drunk individual back to her apartment. Now, that's authorized, right? They should do that. Right. And then they get to the apartment and then they want to make a date of it. Is that prosecutable as misconduct? Well, so there is actually a case that dealt with that scenario that I think is addressed. But the unauthorized act that was charged there was actually that the officer um, failed to report where he was going and entered the apartment without it being part of his assignment to do it. So the unauthorized act was not conflated with the mens rea element. It was separate from it. He wasn't authorized to enter the apartment, and he committed that unauthorized act for the illicit purpose of attempting to obtain sexual relations. That's what has always been required. And I just want to note on that point that there's another problem with the prosecution's theory on all of this, which is this. Um, the prosecution necessarily assumes that there is- Is he authorized to try and return it if, if other police have determined it's not appropriate to return it? The property? Yes. He is, because the penal law absolutely confers authority to the police but to it, return but property. But if that conflicts with, you say it's discretionary, another discretionary determination not, not to return the property. Actually, is he authorized then to go beyond that discretion and exercise his own? Actually, the return of property is not discretionary. It is mandated that property be returned. An arrest is discretionary, but the return of property is not. But if there's a disagreement about whether or not that should be returned? Then in that case, if there's ever discretion that can be exercised, it cannot constitute a crime, as this court announced in People v. La Caruba, because to find that there is a criminal criminal liability for failing to do something that is discretionary is to create an unconstitutionally vague statute. And that is never permitted. Thank That's you, what La Carubo is about. Thank you. Counsel? Good afternoon, Your Honors. Yael Levy for the Office of the Nassau County District Attorney. Your Honors, this defendant, as second deputy commissioner of the Nassau Police Department, had an obligation to investigate and enforce the law without fear or favor. Are you saying he himself had that obligation or those under him or over whom he had authority had that obligation? He had as much of an obligation to make sure that the law was enforced without any favor as any other officer in the department. Every police officer well, has that obligation. How does a uh, police officer know when an arrest must be made. In other words, um, you know, I can think of several scenarios, one in which maybe there are multiple reasons why an officer decides to um, not make an arrest, um, some of which may be appropriate and some of which may not be. Um, but how, how, how does he or she know, for example, here, um, where he sort of indirectly had information from the complainant, as the record indicates, not he, he wasn't directly involved with Ms. Pop, um, and there was some indication that she had asked that it be that the uh, investigation be put on hold, and and they clearly wanted the property back. So how does how does the officer know that it is unauthorized for him to return that property or to fail to arrest? Okay, in this scenario, because I can't answer the question in the abstract, because each of these scenarios turns on the facts. In this scenario, this defendant had unambiguous notice that it was unauthorized to return this property. First of all, he was getting his information exclusively from Gary Parker. He wasn't getting information 
from Poppy directly or even indirectly that she wanted this put on hold. And she did send an email I'm sorry to, to interrupt you, but you yes. said it's unauthorized to return the property. Under what statute or what? I'm not saying that it's unauthorized in general to return stolen property to a complainant who wants it back. I'm saying it was unauthorized in this scenario because of the purpose for which it was undertaken. I was get, getting to that, so Your you're, Honor. You're, you're so you're saying there, there are not two elements to the crime, that there has to be an unauthorized act on its own and then the mens rea to for an un, unauthorized purpose, you're saying those two things are hand in hand, they go together, they're stitched together, and no. they can't be set apart? You, okay, I'll, I'll explain. First of all, Your Honor, the purpose here was to suppress the arrest of Zach Parker. The benefit was to make his father happy. So the mens rea with the intent to confer a benefit is different than the unauthorized purpose here, which the, was the return of property. But where does in the statute refer to unauthorized purpose? The statute refers to intent to benefit and, and by an authorized act. The statute actually doesn't say for the actus reus element unauthorized act. It actually says an act relating to his office, but constituting an unauthorized exercise of his official functions. With regard to the knowledge element, it then says knowing that the act is unauthorized. Which act? The act relating to his office, but constituting an unauthorized exercise of a function, an official function which he is generally authorized to perform. You can't well, exercise- That sounds to me more like the, um, the officer that escorts the woman back to her apartment. The officer is authorized at times as part of his function to enter into people's apartments, but in this particular case, he wasn't authorized because he hadn't called ahead and he hadn't. That, that, that seems okay. to be a different scenario. It, let me give you a different scenario that wait, I- Wait a minute, am I understanding that your argument is that an officer is never authorized, there can never be an authorized act, to exercise their duties and obligations under the law to benefit someone to gather benefit for themselves? I'm saying when an officer commits an act that the officer is generally authorized to perform for an unauthorized purpose coupled with the intent to confer a benefit or deprive someone of a, of a benefit, that is official misconduct by malfeasance. So, so, so our purpose here then is not to look at the act because the act was clearly authorized, the return of property. It's authorized. You're saying it's unauthorized totally? I'm saying that the I way- I thought you were saying, just so I'm clear, and you can explain it to me then. I thought you were saying that his intent was, was to obtain a, a benefit in violation of the statute, but the act itself was not unauthorized. The act of returning stolen property in a vacuum is an oh, authorized act. Didn't, I thought they wanted the property back. Maybe I read the record wrong, but I, I, the way I read it is they wanted the property back. They, kept, they, they were at the point where they needed it back. The school certainly wanted the property back, but not so badly that the school did not want Zach arrested. In fact- no, I understand that, but they did want the property back. That is clear. Of course they wanted okay. their stolen property back. I'm All not right. disputing that. But what I am saying is that when an act is undertaken, even if it's generally authorized, for a purpose which is completely unauthorized- So it's the purpose not the act then, because the act is authorized. It was requested by the person who had had the property taken from them, and this, there doesn't seem to be any violation of any statute or regs saying that he's supposed to give it back. So we're really talking about his intent, right? We are talking about two different things when we say intent and purpose, because the intent to benefit is to benefit Gary Parker. The purpose is to suppress an arrest. I'm not conflating purpose and intent to confer a benefit. They're independent of each other. And, and let me just posit, for example, the Bridgegate scenario, okay? Before you the, go there, sure. is there an authorized way in which to return property? There is. To a victim? Absolutely. 
There is an authorized way, and it's actually set forth in 450.10. And the, the, the statute requires notice upon 15 days to the defense, and it presumes notice to the prosecution. And the best evidence that it presumes notice to the prosecution, aside from the practice commentary where Judge Danino said it does, is the fact that the prosecution, if you look at paragraph two of the statute. Did you raise this issue in, in, your, in the indictment or in the Bill of Particulars or? Which issue, Your Honor? The issue about uh, the statute, 45010. Well, the judge ended up giving a 45010 charge. We didn't indict him for not complying specifically with 45010, but we did indict him for not performing due, well, okay, for the malfeasance count. We, we indicted him very specifically for um, directing a subordinate to return recovered stolen property to a cooperative complainant in an open criminal investigation. Is there any evidence that he directed um, whoever was going to return this property not to comply with the statute in doing so? There is plenty of evidence that he communicated the non-arrest objective. And because he communicated the non-arrest objective to to the sergeant who oversaw the squad, that was Sharp, who in turn communicated it to Coffee. Coffee understood, as he testified, that there was not going to be an arrest because higher ups were not interested in seeing an arrest. There was testimony to that effect, there were emails to that effect, and because Coffee understood that there would never be an arrest in this case, he did not undertake to comply with the normal protocols for preserving property for a future case. So that is how Detective, excuse me, that is how Deputy Commissioner Flanagan gave the direction. He gave it to Sharp. He made very clear the non-arrest objective. And I can go through the evidence, Your Honor, if you like. I've done it in my brief, and I'd be happy to do it here. Would you like me to do that, to go through the dates and, and, and the, the particular emails? I don't no. think that's necessary. No, OK, yeah, because I'd be happy to. But I, I just want to get back to the Bridgegate scenario, because the act of closing lanes on a public road is a generally authorized act. The purpose to punish the mayor of Fort Lee, it makes the act unauthorized. The benefit is to the governor of the state of New Jersey. It's not the same as the purpose. The purpose is to punish somebody. So you can't define. Is that statute the same as the statute under which the, I couldn't that say. Was, well, I could. Isn't that? But isn't what I'm saying is, was, if we define. I'm not saying that this. Is, may or may not be illegal. The question mm -hmm. is, is whether the elements of the crime as set forth in our penal law have been established. They have been established, Your Honor, because the act has to relate to the officer's official function. It has to be an exercise of an official function, which means that generally, under certain circumstances, the public official has the authority to perform the act. And it's only by reference to the purpose for which the act is being performed that it can become unauthorized. The actus reus element in the indictment incorporates that purpose to justify the non-arrest. It's separate from the benefit, which we said was in order to benefit the target's father. We're not conflating purpose with intent. And that's true in so many cases that were decided by the appellate. Like, clarify again. Okay. What, the, the difference between intent and purpose. The intent was to do what and the purpose was to do what? The intent was to benefit Gary Parker, who was a benefactor of the police department and a personal friend of this defendant who had raised And the purpose? And the purpose was to suppress an arrest. Isn't that the same thing? It's not the same thing, Your Honor, the, because the, suppose... The suppression of the arrest is the benefit to Parker. Suppose instead of trying to benefit Parker, suppose, suppose this defendant had no relationship with Gary Parker, but he, he had some animosity toward the principal of this school, okay? Just didn't want to do what she wanted the police to do. So he suppressed the arrest instead to deprive the principal, Principal Poppy, of a benefit, the benefit being seeing that this person whom she asked to be arrested, be arrested. You see, 
I've changed the benefit, but the purpose is still un makes the act unauthorized. Suppressing an arrest for no legitimate discretionary purpose is an unauthorized act. And this defendant was not exercising discretion. There is not a shred of evidence in the record that he was exercising discretion. In fact, he completely abdicated his discretion. He wasn't considering whether this was an individual, the 17-year-old Zach, who was worthy of some sort of lenity. That's not why he what did this. What capacity was he the arresting officer? Any officer anywhere can just arrest someone who's not in their precinct, not you know, they may not even be even. They may not even be related to this crime. They just they hear about it and they're supposed to go make the arrest. Is that it? That's further evidence of how unauthorized his act was because he stepped into a case where he had no business stepping in. Yeah, but my he, my point is, he stepped into a case. You're saying he had no business stepping into it, but mm -hmm. yet he should have arrested this young man. So if doesn't he's, that suggest you're, 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 you, want your, you want to eat your cake and I have understand. it too, right? I mean, Tarsia, right? People versus Tarsia. Um, he, <laughs> he stepped in to a case where he was not in the chain of command and was not involved. But once he got involved, he had an obligation, as does every police officer on the force. And that obligation was to exercise sound discretion and reasonable judgment. And he knew that his subordinates would do as he asked they would in this hierarchical, bureaucratic system that is the Nassau Police Department. And they did. They were all concerned. So are, you, are you suggesting that when an act is discretionary, we, we determine um, based on, we make a distinction based on whether the discretion is um, a, a, a reasonable exercise of discretion? I'm saying, Your Honor, that it's a case-by-case -case determination. These cases turn so much on their facts. It's impossible to say under every circumstance, you know, an act is, is or is not an, a proper exercise of discretion. It depends. Under these circumstances, the evidence- But doesn't, doesn't the actor, doesn't the defendant need to know? Yes. And, and knowledge is certainly a part of this. So and how, how did, did he know? I'm glad how you did, asked. How did you prove that he knew? Okay, I, I've been waiting to get to this part of my argument, Your Honor. He knew for many reasons. First of all, he did know from the policy 4001 and from the procedure 8105 that it was the duty of all members of the force, all members, to detect and arrest offenders and that they will conduct investigations and those investigations have to be complete and thorough and that they must, it says, effects a summary arrest. Um, the manual actually says, with regard to the procedures, even though it says they well, provide- We're talk about also reaching a, a, another acceptable uh, resolution. An acceptable one, one that is acceptable to all the parties involved, which I would imagine would involve well, reaching out to those parties directly and ensuring that this is in fact the result, the resolution that they want. There's no evidence that he ever reached out to the school to be sure that this was the resolution that the school was seeking. Was there any but, evidence that the police did take any investigative steps in this? None. None, Your Honor. There was a video, a surveillance video of Zach on the premises of the school. They didn't collect it. There was a custodian who saw him on the premises. They never interviewed the custodian or took the custodian's statement. There was another dean of students on the premises at the time. He was not interviewed. His, st his statement was not taken. They did not, when they were notified that Kathy Parker was returning her other stolen property to the school. Poppy notified the police that that stolen property was being returned. They had an obligation to make, to pr preserve that property by at the very least photographing it and recording its serial numbers. Nobody showed up to do that when Kathy Parker um, returned that property. They didn't interview anybody involved in this case except for the first officer who showed up, that was Samantha Sullivan, who interviewed Poppy and, and wrote the 32B out, and the 32B said that Poppy wanted an arrest. That was never withdrawn. And she made that arrest objective clear again and again every time she spoke with officers from the 7th Squad. Vastorino came to return property. 
He put a decline to prosecute under her nose. The property was sitting there in front of her in a box. She could have had it back at that moment if she wanted it so badly. She didn't sign that decline to prosecute. She let the detective take that property back to the precinct. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Ms. Aldea, what about uh, your co-counsel's representation that uh, there weren't any investigative steps taken? Your Honor, this investigation was complete by day three. Long before William Flanagan got involved, this investigation was complete. Did they get the complete. videotape and look at the videotape they, and they talk to the They looked at the videotape. Not only that, the property was shown to the suspect's father. The suspect's father said that he recognized it. The suspect made a full confession to the school, which is memorialized in the, in the um, emails that are provided. The only question here was whether an then arrest, in addition to suspension. Why didn't they go forward and make the arrest? Your Honor, I'm not, the court's job is not in this case to determine whether that was wise or unwise. The question is whether it violated, whether it constituted a crime, Correct. not whether it violated a policy or procedure, which are not rules, which are not mandatory, which are couched in discretion. And what I'd like to say Well, is, doesn't that go toward whether it was an unauthorized act? No, Your Honor, it does not. Because the unauthorized act has to be unauthorized for violating some provision that makes it mandatory. 45010 in this case was completely complied with. And I didn't get a chance to say it before, but in this case, there was an inventory that noted the serial number of all of the property that was returned. It's provided in the record for this court. There was a signed receipt by the complainant saying we got this property back. There were photographs taken of the items with serial numbers that are reproduced in the appendix. They're not as clear in the reproduced version as in the original, but they're there. The inventory. Everything was complete. To say that a prosecution could not go forward because there was a return of property is on its face ridiculous. Prosecutions go forward all the time without the property ever being recovered. And every single police witness called by the people in this case said that they understood that the return of the property had nothing to do with the ability to arrest. And that's what I wanted to could say you, could you critically address, before. Yeah. Could you address your adversary's point? that intent and purpose are two different things and that the act only has to relate to the official act of the, it only has to relate to the official duties of the, of the defendant, not that it has to be quote unquote unauthorized. Well, Your Honor, the statutory language is clear that there does need to be knowledge that the act was unauthorized, and there is an element that this court has interpreted, interpreted that the act has to be unauthorized. It is true that the statute has two mens rea requirements, as this court identified in People v. Furyk. One, an intent to obtain a benefit, and one, that it be knowing, in other words, that also being a mens rea or the mental state. But there's no question that there's still a need for an actus reus. What, what I wanted to say critically so is that so the So you're law saying he, 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 he believed that he was totally authorized as an, as an officer to uh, seek to have this property returned with the intent that the charges are dropped so that the father's son is not prosecuted. He understood that that was his role as an officer, that that is what an officer does. Well, Your is that Honor, what you're the act was no, no, no. authorized. Is that, no, no, that's, he, he understood that it was authorized. He also he understood. He understood that he could pursue conduct in an effort to have property returned in the hopes the charges would not be pursued no, Your Honor. against his friend's son. No, he Your understood Honor. that that's the role of an officer. No, Your Honor, and this is the critical point. The reason that this whole prosecution collapses, the reason none of this indictment made any sense, the people's argument claims that there's a nexus and necessarily creates a nexus between the return of the property and the failure to arrest. And the truth is, there is no nexus. Every witness testified that the return of the property had nothing to do with the ability to arrest. The ability to arrest is discretionary. But and that, that, may be, that may be true as a matter of law. They could have gone forward with it. My impression from reading this was that the intent is to discourage the complainant from pushing forward on a prosecution. Your Honor, I'm so, glad, wait, wait, I'm glad wait, you said that. Wait, wait. So they go there, they try to get the school to sign a release and say, we're giving you the property back, you're not going to prosecute. They won't do that, and that's clearly unauthorized. But then it seems, and the jury can reasonably conclude this, that they decide that giving the property back will make it easier for us to shut this case without an arrest. And that's what happens. So 
what, I don't understand why you have to directly link it to you could or you could not legally prosecute them without that evidence. Because the statute requires it and the indictment Where in the statute that. does it require The statute requires that the actus reus, in this case the return of property, be be performed with the intent to obtain a benefit. Right. Now this court- and The benefit there was, it's more likely they won't go forward with a prosecution if we can shut them up and give them their property back. But here's back. the problem with that. There is a difference between getting a signed withdrawal, which means the case is dead, and between it's a degree. hoping. It's no. A, it's, it's a degree It's issue. not, Your Honor. In People versus Bactran, and I will read you the quote, and this is the case that was cited by the prosecution. This court specifically said that in that case, the defendant's hope, the prosecution argued that the defendant's hope that the benefit bestowed would induce a forbidden favor, this court said a mere hope does not furnish criminal liability because a mere hope is different than actually procuring the result. What the prosecution has done on appeal is they've tried to, tried to say that ensuring a result, guaranteeing a result, is the same thing as performing an authorized act, which they've conceded is authorized, an office, or authorized act with the hope that maybe it'll induce the school to drop the charges. And that is not permissible. And the last thing I want to say is that my, my adversary has now transformed the argument before this court into a question as to whether discretionary acts can be criminalized. The United States Supreme Court in Grainhead versus City of Rockford said, a vague statute impermissibly delegates basic policy determinations to the police and eventually to judges and juries, quote, for resolution on an ad hoc and subjective basis with the attendant dangers of arbitrary and discriminatory application. If there is discretion to act, then the act cannot be criminal. If there is discretion to act, according to La Caruba, according to the United States Supreme Court in Grainhead versus City of Rockford, then it would be unconstitutionally vague to predicate criminal liability on that act. So whether we think that Flanagan acted commendably or contemptuously, oh, counsel, the if, fact if, is the act of is not there was a satisfied. clear express policy that says, an officer cannot exercise discretion in order to gain favor or to grant a favor to someone else. If there was a Would clear- that, and, and they did that. Is that there, authorized? If there was a clear rule, yes, that, that matters. not a policy, because the policies and procedures are just like the code of, of ethics was in La Caruba, discretionary, couched with discretion. But if there was a mandatory rule which said that, then I would agree with Your Honor that violation of that rule could constitute the finding and for again, an authorized your, act. And again, your argument is that this officer could believe that an officer could do exactly what I said, and that is wholly within the authority that they have. This officer not only could believe, but knew that when property is requested by a complainant in a case and the defendant wants it returned, it can and should be returned. And this officer further properly exercised discretion during the period in which he was involved in returning the property and waiting to see what the complainant would do next. We're talking about charges limited to the indictment. Not charges, now the prosecutor's claiming he should be, he should be prosecuted or found guilty for the police not inventorying property that never came within their possession. That was never charged. That was never even litigated at trial. And that's how this prosecution has evolved. It's not all bluster for the trial, for the trial uh, attorney to have argued in this case that he was literally playing whack-a-mole throughout this prosecution, because he was. The prosecution's theory changed at every point. When their indictment collapsed because they couldn't prove the elements that they alleged, which include that the compl included that the school never asked for the property, when all of that was revealed false and it collapsed, they changed their theory and were permitted to do it below. And then on appeal in the appellate division, they changed their theory. And then again, before this court, they changed their theory. And now, in oral argument, they changed their theory again. Thank you, Ms. We're Ms. stuck Aldea. to the indictment. Thank you.